Jonah. Jonah, chapter 1, Jonah, chapter 1, right after Obadiah, and before Micah, in between Obadiah and Micah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found the ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down unto it to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, the lightning of them. But Jonah was going down to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for each one here today. Lord, I pray if there be anybody here today in the auditorium that is not saved, I pray that today would be the day that they repent of their sins and receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I pray, God, for your people, Lord, that you help us to draw close to you in these last days. Father, fill us with your spirit. Help us, God, to be uh, the people that you want us to be, dear God. We just thank you that you're still on the throne, that you still have all power in heaven and earth, God. Have your will, God, in this service, we pray in Jesus' precious name. And amen. amen. We read here the first chapter of the book of Jonah, and I want to use this chapter because I want to preach a message, the gospel according to Jonah. The gospel according to Jonah. You say, what, what are you talking about, preacher? You say, the gospel's in here? Oh yeah, there's spiritual application all through the chapter, really through, all through the four chapters of the book of Jonah. We'll primarily be looking at the first uh, chapter, maybe a little bit of the second chapter, but the first chapter primarily. I want to give you three things here, basically. The uh, sailors or the mariners that are on this ship that, that are with Jonah, they represent, or they are, they are a type of the sinner. 
And I'll show you several ways in which they are. Uh, secondly, Jonah is a type of the Savior. Now, Jonah is not a type of the Savior in his rebellion and not doing God's will and going to Nineveh. So it's not a perfect type. But there are some ways in which Jonah is a type uh, of the Savior. And then thirdly, the whale is a type of salvation. The sailors or the mariners are represent or they're a type of the sinner. Jonah is a type of the Savior. And the whale is a type of salvation. Notice, first of all, that the sailors, the mariners that are on these men that are on this ship with Jonah, they represent or they're a type of the sinner. I want you to notice, first of all, three or four R's. Number one, they're religious. They're religious. Notice here in chapter 1 and verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. His God. You know, everybody's got their own God today in America. There's the God of, you know, uh, pleasure. There's the God of education. Uh, there's the God of uh, physical, sexual, sensual type things. I want to be careful this morning what I, how I say some of these things. And, uh, but uh, I want to tell the truth. Uh, America's got a lot of gods. Uh, one of the gods is uh, pornography. and Another god is education. Another god is uh, uh, dope and drugs and alcohol and uh, all these types of things. They're religious. In verse 5 it says, The mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his god. His God. And people today have their own God. That's one of the reasons why they don't want the real God, the true living God, the God of the Bible, is because they have their own gods. And uh, that's what, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul said that they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. In 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, verse 5 to 8, and through there. And so today, people in America have their own gods, and uh, they, they don't want to change gods. And they're religious. Uh, a lot of people are religious. They've been baptized. They've been christened. They've been sprinkled. And uh, they go to a certain church or religion or denomination or whatever. And they do a lot of traditional religious things. Uh, but they've never been born again. They don't have the God of the Bible. I'm glad I got the God of the Bible. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and so, uh, little children, keep yourselves from idols, it says in 1 John 5, 21. Idols and gods of this world. Well, we could preach all day about that. Let me go to the second thing here about the sailors, the mariners represent, or they're a type of picture of the sinner. Not only are they religious, they have his God. They got their own God, which prevents them from getting saved a, a, a lot of times. But notice, secondly, they're reluctant. They are reluctant. They're reluctant to throw Jonah overboard. You say, what do you mean? Because uh, it says even the preacher Jonah said to throw him overboard. Here in the chapter, we read it. And uh, in chapter 1, and uh, verse 12, he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be called unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. And so, and what do they do? 13, nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. They're reluctant to throw him overboard. They eventually finally do, but they're reluctant. You say, what's that mean, preacher? I'm glad you asked. The sinner won't do what God says to do to be saved. They want to make up their own way. They want to do their own thing. You say, what do they want to do? They want to row hard. They want to work. They want to get baptized. They want to get baptized. They want to work they want to have good works. They want to be a particular church. You say, where does it say they rode hard? Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land. They're reluctant. They row hard. You see that? And even Jonah says to throw him overboard. Rode hard. In chapter 1, verse 5, then the mariners were afraid, cried every man unto his God, watch this, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. That's what they did over there in Acts 27 when Paul was in the ship there. They started getting rid of things out of the ship because the thing was going to sink. Remember that in Acts 27? They got rid of the wares and stuff. You know what it's a picture of? 
I, you say, are you, are, are you saved, sir? Well, I, I don't know if I'm saved, but I, I quit this. And I quit that. And I got rid of this. And I got rid of those wares. And I got rid of this. And I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't cuss. I don't chew. I don't go with those who do. And I don't do this. And I don't do that. And everything else. Lighten it of the wares. And that's a picture of working. They cast forth the wares to lighten it. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Mm -hmm. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. So they're religious, they got his God, verse 5. <clears throat> they're reluctant to throw him overboard. The sinner is, I mean, that's what I did. You did, probably did it too, most of you. I mean, how many of you, the first time you heard the gospel, you said, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm getting saved. You, you, you didn't get saved. Most people don't get saved the first second that they hear the gospel. They want to justify themselves. They want to say, I'm just as good as the guy down the road. I'm not as bad as this guy down here. He says he's a Christian. You see? Or you want to row hard. See? Jonah even told him to throw me overboard, and they still didn't do it right away. Uh, Al Hamby witnessed me for about 14 months. I didn't get saved first time he told me. First week, or first month, first day, first week, first month, six months or a year. About 14 months. Some people, they don't get saved for 20 or 30 or 40 years later. Some of them never get saved. But the application is here is that they're reluctant to throw him overboard. The sinner won't do what God says to do to be saved. They want to think that their baptism is going to get him to heaven. They want to think that their church membership is going to get him to heaven. They want to think that their good works and their little religious uh, duties and this, this and that. No, folks, the, the Bible says that you and I are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Romans 3.24. And so they rode hard. They rode hard. Working at it. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. His faith in Romans 4, verse 5. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so uh, they're religious. They got his God, verse 5. They're reluctant to throw him overboard. They won't do, the sinner won't do what God says. I mean, they're bound and determined to get to heaven some other way. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me in John 14.6. So they're reluctant to throw him overboard. The sinner won't do what God says. Even Jonah said, throw him, throw me overboard. And they're reluctant. Then they row hard. Picture of works. Trying to work, you know, work their salvation. I, I believe I just, I believe I just keep doing this. And I, I believe I just keep doing that. And I'm just trying to be a good person. I'm just rowing hard. You'll never get the boat to the shore. And then, uh, Something happened to make them afraid. It's not really an R in there, but something happened to make them afraid. You say, where's that at? Chapter 1, verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Some things, got to, some things got to start breaking up in a person's life to get them to God. An unsaved or even a saved. Let me tell you something. Your unsaved relatives and neighbors and friends and family and your backslidden Christian people, family relatives that you know that don't want to come to church, don't really want to serve God but profess to be saved, the only way they're going to get right with God is something has to, God's got to send a, verse 4, a great wind into the sea and a mighty tempest to the sea and God's got to break up their ship a little bit. You say, preacher, how can you say that? I say because it's, it's in the Bible. We live in a day and time where people, let's be honest, in America, folks, they sat up and they watched uh, people get their heads cut off, dismembered bodies, the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, horror, horror movies, and people killing each other, bludgeoning each other, all kinds of blood, brains, and guts splattered everywhere all night long, and they come to church like this.
And the preacher's supposed to get up and move them. Or the Holy Spirit's supposed to move them. They ain't going to be moved, honey. They're like a zombie. Ephesians 4.18 says, who being past feeling. That's America. Watch this. Pinch. Don't feel it. Zombie. Who being past feeling. We're dealing with zombies in America today. Human zombies. Because of the stuff they've taken in their mind, their brain, their heart, and their life. Verse 5, then the mariners were afraid. They got, you got to get a little afraid. Something's got to happen in their life. Something's got to happen. After there was a great earthquake, remember? Uh, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken in Acts 16, the Philippian jailer came in trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do I got to do to be saved? He said, what did he just see? He saw a number of things. God moved in his life. He saw a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. And all the inmates didn't leave. None of the inmates left. Paul said, do thyself no harm to the jailer because he's going to kill himself. Because back then, when the prisoners escaped, they killed the jailer. And Paul rushes out there and says, do thyself no harm for we are all here. And there he's thinking, you're all here. They didn't accept. What's, what does every inmate want to do? They want to get out. They want to escape. And they never escape. I preached on this many times through the years. They never escape. We went through it in our verse by verse study in Acts in great detail. But they didn't escape. That put him under conviction. The, the earthquake definitely put him under conviction. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You've got to pray for a spiritual earthquake to take place in your unsaved relatives' lives or your backslidden Christian family members' lives. So I couldn't do that. Well, whatever. You don't want them to get right with God? That's what it's going to take. Because they'll just coast right along in their life. They won't think nothing about God or nothing. Church, Bible, souls. They're caught up in the world, man. Uh, Daniel 5, Belshazzar, we won't turn to it, but Belshazzar there took the, uh, the uh, vessels of God out of the uh, temple of God in Jerusalem there in Daniel chapter 5. You can read about it. Make a long story short. And it had to have a big party, more or less thumbing his nose up at God, using the vessels of God to drink and to do all the stuff they were doing there at the party and everything, thumbing her nose up at God. And then the fingers of a, of, of, of a, a hand wrote on the plaster. Remember that? That was God. And it says his, his loins, his, the joints, and his knees knocked up against each other. You can read about it in Daniel 5. He was scared to death. Amen. And in Daniel 5.30, he was killed that evening, that night. Meaning, meaning, tekel, tekel, a parson, all that. Remember, thou art waiting, the balance is found wanting. All that's in Daniel 5. That's what the interpretation was. Hey, king, your number's up, buddy. And that evening he was dead. Spitting in God's face. I'm telling you, something's got to happen. There has to be an, an, inje an injection of God sending an earthquake, hands on the plaster of the wall, writing and scaring Belshazzar to death. There has to be something. Here in chat, Jonah 1.5, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. You see, when folks get afraid, all they got is their own God. They don't have our God. Terrible. They can have it. But they don't want it a lot of times. You know why? You know why they're reluctant? Because they'd rather row hard. I'm working at it. I want to do it. I want to do it. He ain't going to do nothing but go to hell. <coughs> Something happened to make them afraid. And then uh, we're still on the first thing here. Sailors, mariners, uh, type and center. And last of all, this, this first point, notice uh, they're religious, they're reluctant, they rode hard. Uh, something happened to make them afraid. You just got to pray that God send a, a spiritual earthquake. That's what I pray. I pray God sends a spiritual earthquake 
and my unsaved relatives, family members, people that I dearly love into their lives, or the backslidden Christians, people who say they're saved but don't care two flips about God and don't really seem to just... I pray for a spiritual earthquake in their life. I say, preacher, how can you do that? Because I love them. If I didn't love them, I wouldn't pray for that. Because you don't want them to stand at the judgment seat of Christ as, as Christians and, and get, gotten away from God and not gotten back with the Lord before they leave this world. You say, well, the main thing is they're saved and they're not going to hell. Yeah, but there's a judgment seat of Christ. And the unsaved people are going to be cast into hell. But then notice, fifthly, they repented. They obeyed. They obeyed and they threw him overboard. Verse 16. Look at verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. Verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea and the sea ceased from her raging. You see that? You know why the winds of people's lives are raging in their souls and in their hearts? And their lives are all tore up. And they, when you look at them, they look like they've been sucking on pickles for 10 years because they're so miserable and they're, they're not right with God. They're not saved. They're not living for God as a Christian, whatever it is. You don't want to know why <coughs> the sea is raging in their lives because they haven't done what God says to do. That human heart, I want to tell you something. If a person wants to go to hell, they're going to go to hell. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You say, whose heart? Your heart and my heart. And your children and grandchildren and mine. The heart is, just Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. He said, They repented. They, uh, they obeyed and threw him overboard. You know what a sinner has to do? Obey the gospel. Obeying the gospel is not getting baptized. Obeying the gospel is believing the gospel. What is the gospel? Paul said, I, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received where you stand. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he's buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, verse 3, and verse 4. He said the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It has nothing to do with good works, church membership, or getting baptized. And that's why people try to invent their own gospel, because the true gospel, the real gospel of the Bible, has nothing to do with man's deeds or works or what he can do or anything. And man don't like that because man's very proud. Amen. You say, where did they get that pride from? We were born with it. Amen. Amen. Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which has delivered you. Obey from the heart, believe the gospel. How do you know? Romans, Romans 10, 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. What's obeying the gospel? Believing the report of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Isn't that Bible something? The sailors represent, or the mariners represent a type of the sinner. Secondly, Jonah is a type of the Savior. Jonah is a type of the Savior. You say, what do you mean he's a type of the Savior? Well, first of all, he gave his life that these uh, mariners would be saved. He said, throw me overboard. Now, I know, I know he's running from God and he's rebelling, so in that sense, he's not a type of Christ. Okay? I, Christ obeyed the will, the will of the Father and Christ died on the cross and did. He didn't rebel. Or but there's some aspects here where Jonah is a type of the Savior. And one of them is, is that he gave his life that they would be saved. Jesus said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. And, and there in Roman, and John 10, verse 17 and 18. He's a type of the Savior. He gave his life that they would be saved. And uh, he, uh, he, didn't, he didn't leave him down in hell. 
And Jonah 2, look at Jonah 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. He's praying, he's inside of this whale. And he's praying inside the whale. Verse 2, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. You see that? Out of the bat, 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 uh, belly of hell, cried I. That's, and then you know what it says about Jesus in Acts 2, 27? Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Amen. Talking about Jesus Christ. Jonah's a type of Christ. Uh, as a man, Jesus Christ had a human body, a human soul, and a human spirit. At his death, his spirit went back to the Father. His body went into the grave, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And his soul went straight down to the center of the earth through hell and came out leading captivity captive, according to Ephesians 4, verses 8 to 10. You know what Jesus said about himself and Jonah in Matthew 12, 40 to 42? For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this great uh, and... With, uh, with, with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. That's Matthew 12, 41 and 42. And so another type, uh, Jonah's a type of the Savior. He gave his life, they'd be saved. Didn't leave his soul, uh, didn't leave him down in hell. But Jonah had a resurrection, and so did Jesus Christ. Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'm glad Jesus came up out of the grave. Amen. Amen. Jonah came up out of the well. Yeah. He had to learn a lesson. Uh, another, another way Jonah is a type of the Savior, he was sent to preach. Jonah was sent to preach. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Look at uh, uh, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. First verse in the book. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Ammonai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Cry against it. Preach. And Jesus talked about the preaching of Jonas. And Jesus was called to preach, obviously. He said, The Lord, uh, the Lord uh, has sent me to preach to heal the brokenhearted and all that. In Luke 4, 18. Matthew 4, 17, he says that, Jesus began to preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jonah was sent to preach to Nineveh. Christ was sent to preach. And another aspect in which Jonah is a type of the Savior is notice in Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish for the presence of the Lord. And that's, that's, not, that's where he's not a type of Jesus. He's rebelling there. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof. Woo! We ought to shout and run the aisles on this one. He paid the fare thereof. Jesus paid it all. Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. Now he's paying the fare of Jonah for disobeying God. Amen. But Jesus didn't disobey God. He paid the fare. He said, what did he pay? The, he, didn't, he paid the, for, the, for the sins for you and I. He shed his blood. He is the propitiation. A propitiation is a payment. He is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Yeah. First John 2, 2. For God so loved the world, he'll have all men to be saved. He wants everybody to be saved. He's hyper, dumb, hyper-Calvinist. So only the elect. Where do they get that from? They get it from their own little pea brain. You got quiet on me there, didn't you? <laughs> he paid the fare there of 1 Corinthians 6, 20. For ye are bought with a price. You're bought with a price. 2 Peter 2, 1 says that Jesus uh, bought unsaved false prophets and teachers. He bought them. They have to get saved. You say, what's that mean? What do you mean? 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Christ bought him. He bought everybody. But you have to repent and get saved. He hath purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, 28. Ephesians 1, 14 talks about the redemption of the purchased possession. I can preach on this stuff all day long. Jonah, a type of the Savior. 
What a book. He paid the fare thereof. I want you to know he paid for every single person's sins. Amen. He paid for my sins on the cross of Calvary. And then the whale, thirdly, last of all, the whale is a type of salvation. You say, what do you mean is a type of salvation? First of all, notice the whale was prepared by God. Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. He's called a fish, he's called a whale. See that? Uh, the great fish is obviously not just a big fish. Christ calls it a whale in Matthew 12, 40. And uh, Moses included whales with fish in Genesis 1, 21, long before anybody classified them as mammals. So Jonah 1, 17, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. He prepared a great fish. Swallow up Jonah. Prepared. You said, what's that got to do with anything? Well, did you know that 1 Peter 1.20 says about Christ, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you? Do you realize that Jesus Christ was prepared? Do you realize in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, Christ talking there, he said, but thou hast prepared a body for me. That body prepared, that was God manifest in the flesh. His body, Christ was prepared. Uh, the, the, the whale was prepared. Noah's ark was prepared for delivering the people back in Noah's day. So how do you know that? 1 Peter 3.20. 1 Peter 3.20. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. Wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved. Nobody was interested in getting in the ark. Everybody was busy with their lives. Yeah. Busy going to Walmart, and Kmart, on the garage sales, and yard sales, and on you know, vacations and spending money and going to the mall. And <laughs> That's great. Go for it, man. That's what Christ is talking about in the Gospels. When he says, in the days of Noah, in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they planted, they married, they gave, they were given in marriage, all that. There's nothing wrong with those things that he mentioned. What he's trying to say in those verses, which a lot of preachers don't preach it right, what he's trying to, he's not saying there's anything wrong with that. He's saying what they were doing is they were going on their everyday lives without any regard for God. You know anybody like that? They'll talk to you about sports, politics. They'll talk about politics all day long. They'll talk to you about the weather. They'll talk to you about their money, their vacation, their kids, their grandkids, their clothes, their money, their house, their carpet, their furniture. Their... But mention God. Mention serving God. Mention God. Hey, let's go to church. <laughs> Oh my God! Oh God! Oh God! Help me! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> prepared by God, Jesus Christ's body was prepared. Now you know why I don't have five hundred people in my church. Amen. <laughs> Noah's ark was prepared. I just tell it like it is, baby. That's all, I, that's all I've ever done for 45 years. Notice something else. That uh, the whale obeyed God. The whale obeyed God. So what do you mean? Chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. It says he prepared the great fish. I don't know if the Lord didn't say it. But I don't know if the Lord said, hey, whale, go swallow that preacher, backslidden preacher. I don't know if he talked to him or what, but the whale went ahead and did it. He said, how do you know he obeyed? Look at chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord, he not only swallowed him up, but the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So the, the whale obeyed him. The whale obeyed God when God said, go swallow that preacher there, that Jonah. And then the whale had to obey again to vomit him up on the dry land in a period of time later. Do 
You know, there's animals in the Bible that obey God. He has control over the animals, by the way. You know that? He has control over the animals. Those lions, Daniel's lions in there, never put one tooth on Daniel. The whale obeyed God. Jonah was sealed up in the whale. Look at chapter 2, verse 5. Jonah 2, 5. I'm almost done. The waters compassed me about even to the soul, the depths. The depth closed me round about. When you get saved, you're closed up round about. You're sealed. Amen. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Uh, you, you don't have no weeds. Well, sometimes we might feel like we got weeds wrapped around our head. But verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. And earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee and thine holy temple. So Jonah was sealed up in the whale. When you get saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. This is the gospel according to Jonah. And then, last of all, look at chapter 2, verse 10. I just read it. And the Lord spake unto the fish. The Lord talks to fish and they obey. <laughs> And it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. The whale got Jonah to the other shore. The whale is a type of salvation. You know God's going to get you to the other shore, the other side. Praise God. One of these days. As I close... The sailors, the mariners, represent, or their type of the sinner. Gave you several ways they were. Jonah, even though he rebelled, he's not a type of the Lord Jesus, obviously, in, in that rebellion, disobeying God, but there's some other ways that he is, and I gave you four or five things there. He's a type of the Savior. He gave his life that they would be saved. He said, throw me overboard. Throw me overboard, you'll be saved. This tempestuous, raging waves of the sea will... We'll take this boat, this boat, and you won't sink and drown. Throw me overboard. I'm the reason why. And you know, some here a couple different times in this chapter. I mean, there's so many different things in this chapter. I think we went over a lot of this. In our, did we go? Did I teach John verse by verse? I can't remember. But anyways, I preached on. It. There's so much stuff in this chapter, chapter one especially throughout this little four chapter book. But you notice these men; they immediately knew that something was wrong when the when the ship started going back and forth. Everything, and they go to Jonah and they say, what, What's your occupation? What's your problem? What, what, why have you caused this to come upon us? They even know that when something bad happens, sometimes, not all the time, that it could be due to the fact that somebody ain't right with God. Because he told them, He told them in chapter 1, uh, verse 6. So the shipmaster came to him, he's back there sleeping. You know, the backslider's asleep. The end of verse 5, Jonah, he's laying, he's fast asleep. Verse 6, so the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon him. They're kind of irritated that he's sleeping. Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. They had enough sense to know that God calls them to die. And they said, everyone to his fellow, come, let us cast lots, we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. Well, they already know that he has talked to him. So they cast lots, and lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose calls this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? What people art thou? In other words, what's going on, Jonah? What'd you do? What, how did you disobey God? Well, God called, God called me to go preach to Nineveh. I don't want to go to the people. I hate the people. And the Syrians. So I'm on the Tarshish. I'm going to do what I want to do. And if the preacher don't like it, he can lump it. And if the church don't like it, they can lump it. You know, any, you know any Christians that act like that? I've seen a few in the last 45 years. Verse 9, he said that I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid. They're afraid again. 
They're afraid back in verse 5. The mariners were afraid. And they're afraid again here in verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid. Said unto him, I'm going to tell you something. When God starts working, people ought to start fearing. Amen. But I'm glad we got God on our side. Amen. Amen. This whale got him to the other shore. You know what? You might be going through a lot of trials, tribulations, valleys. You might, might be some things in your life you don't like. I'm going to tell you what, one of these days, if you're saved, if you're saved, you're going to go to heaven. And you're going to be there forever. But while we're here on this earth, folks, let's try to get everybody saved that we can. Let's try to take everybody we can with us. Amen? Your family members, friends, relatives, just imagine them burning in hell forever. Like I told you a hundred times, Charles Spurgeon said the hell of hell is the fact that it's forever. I mean, you can't even grasp Try to think about it. Think, I mean, you can think of 50 years or 100 years. Think about eternity. You can't even grasp it. You know why? Because you're finite. He's infinite. He don't have no beginning. You do. He's always been. That's how long people are going to be in hell that reject Christ. Forever. They're never going to get out. I got relatives, I think about them all the time, family members. I think about them, I think about them, how nice and sweet some of them are, and they, they don't think about it, they want to burn in hell. You know why? Because a lot of them, they're rowing hard. They're rowing hard. They've been told a lot of what to do. But like these mariners, these sailors, they're not going to throw him overboard yet. We're going to, we're going to work at it. I think if we, I think, if we, I think if we work this thing out, we can do it. Keep, keep rowing, boys. Thirteen says the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. You can't do it on your own. You got, to, you, got you got to have Jesus pay. He paid the price for you. You just got to say, God, I accept you as my Savior. I don't want to go to hell. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Amen. Let's stand if you would.